Hello, I'm Alex Mansfield with Manny Things, and welcome to another episode of Manny Talk Shooting, the show where I talk to individuals all across the shooting industry. We'll talk competition, self-defense, concealed carry. If you enjoy this content, check out our YouTube channel, Manny Things. Without further ado, let's get to this episode. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Manny Talk Shooting, the show where I talk to individuals all across the shooting industry, because I feel like it. Uh, but let's get today's sponsor. Today's uh, show is brought to you by Go Fast, Don't Suck. Bill over at Go Fast, Don't Suck. Uh, he makes hats, jerseys, shirts, uh, memes for all you haters on the internet. So go check out GoFastDon'tSuck.net and uh, maybe you'll buy some cool stuff. And I don't care. Just go buy stuff. But without further ado, let's introduce today's guest. Today we have Mr. Adam Maxwell from Vortex Optics. Adam, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. And actually, I carry around a set of Go Fast, Don't Suck targets in my travel backpack to dry fire on the road because I travel a lot. So I actually have multiple sets of them either set up in my house or that travel about the country with me. So good stuff. I agree. And they must definitely be handy since you are always on the road. Yes. (laughs) Yes, they get used, get used quite a bit. That is for sure. Well, Adam, I know a little bit about who you are. Um, I met you through the power of the internet via Mr. Steve Fisher. We were probably watching a million live streams at the same time with Steve rambling. So that's how I kind of met you. Um, But go ahead and tell the um, listeners kind of who you are and uh, how you got uh, started at Vortex. Okay. uh, Adam Maxwell, I got into the shooting sports Honestly, I saw it on TV when I was 12 years old. Um, my dad was a once a year deer hunter, not opposed to guns, really, just not really into them. Um, but I used to watch TNN Outdoors every Sunday night, and there was a show called American Shooter, uh, which lives on today as Shooting USA. Uh, but at the time, that was my first exposure to IDPA, USPSA, three gun, all that stuff. And, uh, I saw it. My eyes got the size of saucers and I was like, I don't know if I'll ever be that good or if I, but I want to do that. Um, I had to wait till I was 21 to buy a handgun. And uh, um, from there started in IDPA, my local club. And then, um, then uh, some friends of mine said, well, if you like this, you should try a three gun. And I was like, what, what's three gun. (laughs) And then, uh, then uh, things escalated fairly quickly from there. I bought my first AR-15 in 2010. Um, and then shortly thereafter, kind of started traveling the country, uh, going to major events, submitted to the uh, Three Gun Nation Semi-Pro Series when that was a thing. Uh, eventually got called up to uh, the Pro Series in 2016, 2017, the last two years that they did it. Um, and then kind of been kind of been on the three gun scene for a long time shoot uspsa locally here um been doing it more seriously lately um just because i, I don't know just kind of the dynamics of 2020 2021 um but at the same time my my regular career was uh i was actually a farmer by trade i was uh, i went to school for all that stuff I was working for a very large cattle outfit um in uh, minnesota Got on the sharp side of a layoff and uh, took a job with some friends that I knew from shooting at their gun store for something to do just to keep me kind of on a schedule. If you've ever been unemployed, you know what that's about. Uh, so just something to do. And and yeah, some hours turned into part time, turned into full time, turned into, you know, kind of a shift lead uh, person at a very prominent gun store. Arms and arms. Shout out to my arms and arms people um, in uh, in. Eden Prairie, Minnesota, in the metro, metro of Minneapolis. And um, from there, in my, in my dealings with Three Gun, had some friends. One of our friends, um, Ruben, was the one, the first one to get the job at Vortex. He was working at Shields at the time, met who is now our VP of sales, got, got roped into headquarters. And every time they needed somebody, Ruben knew somebody to call. And so one day, one Friday, uh, I got a phone call that said, hey, you should have your resume to this guy by Monday. And uh, I did. <clears throat> and um, they were looking for, at the time, they were looking for a rifle scope specialist in customer care, which I think is a position they kind of made to entice somebody to take the job. I think they're kind of having a hard time finding a customer care person. 
Uh, so I took it as a rifle scope specialist, um, did that for nine months before I got the opportunity to move over to uh, cons- what we call consumer sales, but what the world would call tech support. Um, did tech support for another nine months uh, before I got the opportunity to, uh, to transition to what I do now, which is I'm an account manager for law enforcement sales and law enforcement and military sales. Um, so get to focus specifically on those customers now and, um, and biz dev in that direction. In addition to the extracurricular activity of being on the, the, the shooting team. So. That's pretty interesting. I, I knew you'd started in, you know, in that other position, but it's, um, was that a linear progression or is it like a big, like vertical jump to go from where you started in Vortex to where you are now? We're a pretty flat company, so there are there was a lot of horizontal jumps, but um, a big scope and change from what you were doing. So customer care is a lot of shipping labels and missing parts and uh, angry people. Not not really angry people. It's fun to say, but um, <laughs> but it's a lot of it's a lot of the. Um, when you, when you call the customer care people, they're very good at getting you taken care of. They don't really know a lot about the product, for being honest. The group of people that knows about the product is consumer sales. Uh, they didn't have an opening there at the time, but, but uh, um, uh, when an opening came available, um, uh, I backfilled it at that time. Um, it, they kind of just, you, they, I was onboarded in customer care because that's what they had. Um, but they kind of planned on moving me somewhere as it became available. And then uh, the guy, the guy who moved out of consumer sales moved into the law enforcement position when that was a vacancy. Um, and so I backfilled his position and then I wrote an email a week for eight months uh, until they, they let me go over there too. Uh, Cause that was a growing demographic at our company. So it's kind of, it's kind of one of the last frontiers of Vortex um, that's growing from a, from a business standpoint on the sales side. Um, so that was, that was appealing in addition to just, those are the, co- those are the products that I like. And those are the customers that I, that I naturally like working with. So um, just kind of a transition from roles of, of customer care to technical questions, consumer sales are basically, they're the ones that know all the things about the product backwards, forwards, and sideways. Um, and then to essentially move into a more specialized customer facing role in law enforcement. So uh, not necessarily linear, I'd say they're more, more horizontal, just as the opportunities presented themselves uh, was, uh, was in the, like many things in my career, both professional and shooting is right place, right time. Uh, a lot of stuff. So mm-hmm. that's pretty cool. Yeah. So you're doing the vortex thing still. Um, and you're doing the military military and law enforcement sales, which is kind of cool. That gets you on the road traveling, doing demos, I'm assuming. Oh yeah. Yep. Yep. Have gun will travel. Get to go get to go um, do all that stuff. And it's kind of it kind of is what you make it. So I'm I like the shooting and and the demos and and stuff like that. So I kind of seek that stuff out. And if you go looking for it, you tend to find it. So um, for example, what I do a lot of now. Um, just kind of out of a need, somebody wanted to do a low power variable, uh, carbine integration training. They're like, could you show us how to do it? And I'm like, well, it's not that complicated. So sure. Um, and then, uh, did one and then it came up later. Somebody wanted else wanted to do it. Well, could you write that up for us? And so I made an outline of what I did. And then that turned into, uh, uh, presenting it at conferences. And then it turned into, you know, we kind of it's kind of a traveling road show. Now I've done it several times and, um, we'll either do it in support of our area distributors, um, for, for various departments, or we'll go to specific departments and kind of train the trainer best practices type stuff. A lot of, well, I mean, if you follow Fisher, it's a lot of, it's, it's a little bit more polished than he would say it, but it's a lot of just kind of separating the, the, the fact from the fiction, like, you know, uh, here, here's all that stuff that people say. Yeah. Yeah. Let's we'll go ahead and we'll set that in the trash can over here. Here's what really matters, you know, and like, uh, here's how you set it up properly and here's what you need to know. And it's really not that scary if you just get out on the range and shoot with it. So that's what we end up doing. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and 
and you fi we finding more and more that uh, departments um, are headed towards the LPVO instead of the red dot. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and it comes from a place, uh, especially in kind of a post George Floyd world. Um, it comes from more of a, a PID or a positive identification standpoint. It's it, it's a tool that it adds diverse or it adds diversifies the capability of a patrol rifle, and they have a little bit more ability to differentiate is that the guy is that not the guy is it a phone or is it a gun um the quintessential uh, demonstration was about a year ago there was well almost exactly a year ago uh there was a shooting or a shootout in uh phoenix phoenix yeah guy in the middle of the street hostage you know had the baby had the gun to the head of the baby 50 yard shot they pulled up opened the door from the from the crack of the you know, from the door frame of the squad car, zoomed up to like three power and headshot the guy. Like that's kind of the the uh, the textbook example of why it should be in patrol cars. And there's lots of agencies moving in that direction. Um, but <clears throat> the wheels of change in in an ins institutional inertia driven environment like that is very very slow. So you get you get early adopter departments on board and then the departments in their area kind of start to get on board, but it's kind of, you kind of go everywhere um, addressing the questions of the old guard everywhere. You know, um, mm -hmm. everyone's got their, it's always, it's always a former Marine sniper. Um, no, nothing against former Marine snipers, but it's always a former Marine sniper that has all the questions at every department you go to about, about this, that, and the other, and anything you do with the rifles. So, um so yeah we just go there and we we address the questions and separate the facts from the fiction and and then uh they're at least even if they don't decide to do it they're in a position to make an informed decision which is really all i ask i was like make, make a decision from a from a place of information not you know uh fallacies that have been regurgitated you know, since the 90s so oh yeah absolutely i i think that's now, as everyone, we hope we that everyone makes a good informed decision with facts and data and talking points instead of this is how I used to do it back in the Marines. No, not picking yep. on the Marines in general, but it's the they are fun. One. They are fun to pick. I on. know if you know enough of them, it's okay. <laughs> yep, just give them the green crayon; it'll be fine. Yeah, but we're not savages, so the Crayola ones, you know, in the big box, right? Yeah, <clears throat> <laughs> so they have all the greens to pick from. <laughs> But um, I know we'll talk a little bit more about Vortex probably later on. I kind of want to dip back into what made you fall in love with Three Gun. Ah, uh, I think so. Especially in the, when I was getting into this, I was in my early twenties. Um, so um, very much an adrenaline junkie, I guess. I mean, I came, I came out of high school. I was riding motocross and and backcountry snowmobiling and stuff like that, and I always liked shooting, but uh, what what appealed to me about the big matches is they were a bit more of a or, or matches in general is that three gun was a bit more of a spectacle. So IDPA was cool. Like you couldn't you couldn't just go and set that at that time anyway. It's as small as my view of the world was. You couldn't just go set that stuff up. So like here is a way that you could shoot something cool with a handgun. Well, and then there's USPSA and they had like courses that were two or three times the size of idpa like whoa oh that's cool and then the, then a three gun course is literally three times the size of, you know so it was it was just kind of this montage of shooting and brass and hulls and magazines and everything flying everywhere and like that that just really appealed to me and at the time the show three gun nation was on um so i see videos of uh specifically the iron man the mgm iron man uh where uh that match is notorious for uh, shooting from zip lines, uh, shooting from golf carts while it's driving them. Um, all, all the flippy, you know, launchy circus targets you could ever meet, like all that, all that was awesome. And so it was kind of, kind of like on my limited budget, if I was going to do something, I was going to go do the one that was the biggest spectacle. Um, so, you know, I've been in this action shooting sports for 15 years. I went to my first area match this year. Cause like, it was just never, it, it was just never an attraction for me. The three gun matches were all, always, um, they kind of had that adventure aspect to them in course design. Uh, whereas, whereas, um, 
uh, the pistol sports are a little bit more, uh, they color a little bit more inside the lines and they're a little bit more down to earth in their format, I guess. Um, so kind of, yeah, just kind of the spectacle of it. And I liked all the guns and you could use all the guns and we were using all the kinds of ammo. I mean, we were using 55s and 77s. We were shooting birdshot slugs and birdshot or buckshot and, you know, uh, pistols too. And you had to start with it all on you. And it was, uh, it was just, uh, a, a big circus, I think was the initial attraction. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's very addicting from there. So, mm-hmm. Now, have you ever dabbled in a four by four, two by four? Just a little bit. Um, if I were quite honest, I don't have much attraction to PCCs. I do have some. Mm-hmm. I have shot some nice ones. Um, but um, given the choice, I would rather shoot a true three gun division or I would rather shoot a pistol. Like if we're at a one gun match, I would rather shoot a pistol division than a PCC division. Um and so it just it just never really never really appealed to me over a traditional three gun division or a pistol. Um, but my good like my good friend Ruben's exactly the opposite. He he'll shoot a PCC anytime, given given the chance, he'll shoot it anytime. Um, so it just just never really tripped my trigger that way. Um mm-hmm. nothing against it, but it's just it was just never quite for me. I did actually I do um I did get into uh, running matches eventually also. So uh, match directing and, and range master stuff. So at my match, I did begin uh, recognizing two by four um, because we were trying, we do a shoot off format. And so the first time we said it's just tack optics and everybody fits into tack opt- optics except open people. And while well, there's like set like three of those, so screw those guys. Um, mm-hmm. But they were actually our friends. <laughs> They're like, well, we want to shoot two. And so we're like, okay, well, that was when two by four came on. So we're like, all right, well, we'll recognize two by four in hopes of luring enough people that we could get a 10 person or an eight person bracket together um, to recognize open division. And then in the meantime, open has become uh, its own, you know, it's the premier class now. So it's not a problem to attract open shooters now. So that's kind of going away from my event. But I did actually recognize the event uh, very early on. Uh, for that reason, even though I personally am not, not super into it. Mm-hmm. Now is, I remember for a minute you were shooting limited in a uh, three gun, I think is maybe for yep. Texas. Yep. But what is your favorite um, division in three gun? I would say, I, I say I identify as a limited shooter. Um, when I made the transition to vortex, when I first started, I was shooting limited um, and I, I believe that was 2017 and I, I won almost everything there was to win, um, in limited at that time. I, I at least I won a lot. Um, and then when I moved to vortex, it just seemed to make sense that, uh, if I wanted to continue shooting or shoot more and be, you know, be supported at, at the factory level, uh, it would make more sense if I was going to work for an optics manufacturer to shoot the division that had the most optics in it. Uh, so that was when I switched over to open uh, where I've been for a little while and then uh, kind of was inspired to try it again. Uh, the uh, well, the summer before I shot it one time because uh, in UML, they have a classification system, the United multi-gun league. They have a classification system. I got my pro coin in open. So I shot limited uh, to get, to get coined pro and limited. And then, uh, yeah, the, what you're referencing last year, I shot a little bit of limited because my buddy just kind of expi- inspired me to do it. And then, uh, I actually think my winter project has been upping my classification in USPSA limited division. I'm, I'm a going on master in that. And I might carry that momentum into the, the spring here. I'm probably going to shoot the first few matches, uh, in limited, uh, this coming year also. Um, seemed like a good idea at the time and it's it's the highest of highs and the lowest of lows just kind of depends on the day if you're hitting or not <laughs> yeah and it's cool to see you actually dabbling kind of back into uspsa uh and um because i knew you were disheartened i know you're probably still disheartened with the uspsa multi-gun rules um and how they're not the best that's correct but at the same time um <clears throat> 
in uh, in the shadows of everything that's going on in that organization right now, there is an interest in updating the rules and um, that's being worked on. I can't really comment too much on it, um, but uh, that is that is being worked on. Um, there is an interest there and and um, um, yeah, they're they're the most prominent sanctioning body in our sport. Um, so if, as long as we have their ear, we're, we're, uh, uh, we being, uh, my, uh, my colleagues, um, Ruben and Travis are the ones who are primarily working on that. Um, but they're, they're working with those folks. Uh, we're a large sponsor of USPSA. So they listen to some things that we say, um, and, and try to, uh, try to move the ball in that direction because yeah, there, there is, there, there's a neglected demographic by that organization, um, uh, for the long guns, you mean, you know, there's, there's long gun world shoots, but we don't really have a pathway to the world shoots in the United States. Um, so some of that stuff is kind of being, being worked out. That'll definitely be nice. And at least I'm glad that the, the body is listening to comp high level competitive multi-gunners to then bring it back and make it not a joke where it's just a one year, a match, one match a year, under uspsa multi-gun rules yep yep so. I, I don't know how much they're listening but their eyes are open and they're nodding so like we'll see how far that goes but, but uh, so at least yeah. the lights no, are on they, right <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah so i i think i mean people at the head of all the organizations all of them to include uml three gun nation uh even smd all well-intentioned people trying to move the sport forward unfortunately kind of like mainstream politics they just kind of get bogged down sometimes and um but there are well-intentioned people trying to move the ball forward in the sport um if uh, if we don't uh if we don't cannibalize them first yeah agreed that's for sure now um you i know that steve anderson comes up to vortex about once a year in You've been on Steve's podcast, uh, yep. if I remember correctly, because he's yep. been there. Yep, um, I was chauffeuring him around. <laughs> I mean, well, it's kind of hard. I mean, he, he probably could get lost in Vortex because he can't say the name right. He can't say where it's located very well, but it's a really big facility <laughs> with a really cool indoor range. We, we bring him here when it's really cold, so it makes it easy to keep track of him. He doesn't wander too far. Just, just put out some letter, put the letter Kenny on and he'll stay there. Right. Yep. Yep. We just kind of turn it on real loud and he'll find his way over to you. But yeah, Steve's a, Steve's a good friend of mm -hmm. ours. He, uh, his, his program aligns a lot with our, our company values. And, um, I think it's also a program unlike a lot of classes you can take. Like once you take a lot of classes, they kind of get repetitive, but since Steve's class is more about, um, the th thinking part of shooting and the evolution, the, the pushing yourself part of shooting people at various levels can take it and people can take it multiple times and get something, a little something different out of it. So yeah, we do like to bring him, bring him back. Uh, he's actually due here in a couple of weeks. Um, he'll be back here again. Um, cause we, we really like his material and believe in all of it. So we, um, you know, on the shooting team side of it, like we, we even, we pretty much speak Andersonian, right? Whenever someone asks how I'm doing, I always say great, just kind of to annoy people <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. But I, I, then I know if you're an Andersonian, you have made, taken mental management probably more than once. Oh yes. It's a wonderful oh, flow yes. chart. Yep. I've got, yep. I've got my flow chart up here. So yep. got stack stacks of performance journals. Uh, always got one going. I, that is, I will say that is the one thing I'm lacking on the Andersonian method. I do not follow the Lanny's uh, performance journal to a T, but I do keep my own performance journal of a sense. But he got know. me. It, he got me the last time into the, the the whole writing it. What was it? I think it was. Uh, it was this. Maybe it was the second time. No, the when he was here, whatever. The way he got me on that, I think he was talking about. Uh, uh who's who's the who's the shooter that he mentors the the gm that's going for the it's going for a national um 
guy with the goats. Oh, Jay Beal. Yeah, I think I think it was Jay Beal that was he was like, hey, Steve, like, come on, man. Do I do I do I really gotta do the journal? I mean, it's it's dumb. He's like, I don't know. Do you want to be a world champion? <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, okay. Well, if you don't, if do you, will you do anything to be a world champion? Yeah. Well, anything includes this. Okay. Do the journal. Yeah. <laughs> so like, he's like, you know, if 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 you don't win and you left something on the table, you'll wonder if that made the difference. And I was like, no, oh, man. God damn it, Steve. You're kind of right. And so, uh, mm-hmm. but it, he's, he's right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, three, three imprints, three imprints, normalizing greatness. You can tell yourself you don't need to do it, but, uh, you're missing out. You're missing out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just wish, oh, well, I guess here's Lanny Basham. I know you're not listening, but if you are, or Steve tell, tell Lanny yearly subscriptions of journals, just to show up one a month, you know, so that I don't have to worry about ordering a new one. Then I'll be all, I'll be all on board. <laughs> well, I just I just write it out. I just know what the segments are. I write it in a blank notebook. <laughs> oh, there you go, smart man. Yeah, get that at CVS anywhere. Mm-hmm. True that. Now, um, you said you're shooting limited in USPSA. Um, what gun are you shooting in USPSA then? All the guns I staged here for you to ask me a question. <laughs> I don't have that one actually. Um, I uh, I got oh. so last year when I set out on that project, I was actually shooting a friend of mine's prototype of what became the Atlas Gunworks Artemis. Um, didn't get it done last year, and so uh, I um, I wrestled a true nemesis out of out of atlas gunworks this year um so quote quote unquote plain jane um uh, atlas gunworks nemesis with the v2 grip so uh 40 cal 5.4 barrel standard configuration i'm left-handed so that's got left-handed bias safeties and then uh dual brass full palm swell uh inserts on both sides and an aluminum magwell with a short trigger. Okay. Now you've been with Atlas long enough. Like you've gone through every hodgepodge gun of, it seems like you've got every oh, in-between model. I do gun. actually. I like to say I was Atlas before Atlas was cool. Come on. I got my first. Well, Atlas it doesn't it help. Right Mark Stevens is. Uh... Yeah. I introduced Ooh, Mark Stevens to Titan. Uh, uh, no, this is pre-Titan. This is when they just did custom guns. Um, oh, damn. But, uh, yes, I introduced Adam Nilsson and Mark Stevens. Um, at the time, well, Mark's, Mark was um, doing freelance marketing work for small small firearms companies. And uh, I was working with him. And one of my jobs was to headhunt accounts. So I, I, was, I was the one that introduced those two. And gosh, look at him now. Yeah, they'd be killing it. But yeah, so no, they're doing cool. a good job. And it's been fun to be a part of the company the whole time. It went from actually, so, I, so I'm working the gun counter at, at this gun shop, uh, Arms and Arms. And uh, we, uh, we handled a very, we had a lot of boutique customers and we had kind of high end um, boutique product in addition to the normal stuff you would have at a gun shop. So we moved a lot of high end specifically pistols. Uh, I, mm-hmm. I sold, I probably sold 20 Wilson combats and 20 Nighthawks a year. Um, in addition to all the other stuff, you know? Um, and so at the time I was working with another gun builder that was on his way out, um, just struggling as a business. And so I, and I needed a backup gun and I had found, I actually found Atlas Gunworks. I was looking, I was trying to figure out why everyone shot 40 in single stack other than mm-hmm. just to shoot their limited ammo. Cause that didn't make sense to me. Mm-hmm. And that was where I found Adam, one of Adam's videos that explained that if you shoot 40 in single stack, you can decide whether you shoot major or minor. And if you shoot minor, you can load 10 round mag. So guys will look at the stages and decide if a 10 round mag will get them past a flat footed reload and they'll have both kinds of ammo. I'm like, Oh, 
that makes sense. Um, so that video, you know, and then I started watching his other videos and I was kind of in the market. So sent him an email. Um, usually inside the industry, you can get a discount of some kind. And so um, it's like, hey, uh, I was looking, you know, I work at this gun shop, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he Googled us. And he called he, well, he in gunsmith fashion, he 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 emails back, call me, period. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> and so I call him. He's like, so let me get this straight. You work at a gun store that specializes in USPSA. And I was like, yeah. He's like, <laughs> oh bro, I'll hook you up. And I was like, oh, oh okay, cool. <laughs> And so, uh, so I, I bought the gun, but you know, he gave me a, gave me an industry discount when that wasn't really something they were doing at the time. And that was this gun. Um, and, uh, I didn't know what to expect. I kind of half thought this thing was going to show up and just automatically be a backup gun. Um, but when we took it out of the box, like that is, it is one of the nicest guns. It's still one of the nicest guns I've ever, I own, um, even of the atlases that I own. Um, and so it's just kind of magic from there and, you know, trying to promote the brand. And so like, um, it was, it was in a house. We were all sharing a house, Verbo and people like Josh Fralick, Josh Tarrant, um, uh, who's a couple others, uh, Sean Burroughs. They're all in it. That was the first time they ever saw an Atlas gun. They all ended up becoming, you know, very big brand ambassadors for, for Atlas Gunworks, and and then it just kind of spread like wildfire once once we were all on board, and um, and now I mean now it's a company that they um, they essentially manufacture. I mean they're the Wilson Combat of wide body pistols. They manufacture all their own parts, which is mm-hmm. no small feat to do in this industry, um, and they still make a premium product, and you can get it in ninety days, which is unheard of. When I first started ordering these pistols, it was like you'll pay us the money and you'll wait a year maybe a year and a half and you'll like it, you know, whereas like, no, I mean, you know, if they're in stock. You can order them now or, or it'll be here in 90 days. Like that, that timeline was just unheard of at the time and, and really made them an innovator without, without degrading the product that they're selling. The product that they're selling now is probably, it might even be better now than it was back then. Certainly the frames and the grips are, um, mm-hmm. Yeah. This was one, actually this gun, this is the first gun that he ever installed a Phoenix grip on too. When the Phoenix Evo grip first came out, that was the first one he ever installed too. So that's, that's a, yeah, that's a really old Atlas pistol in the, in the world of evolution of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's always, it's always cool to see these, you know, the evolutions and you can, it's kind of cool because you can just look at your safe and see them all. Like that one's this old and you got this one and this one and that one. Yeah, no, I got... these people are never going to see this gun because it's not going to come to production. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that, that seemed like a good idea, but it wasn't. Um, even some of my like original gear, I got like mm-hmm. some of my original three gun rifles. Um, you know, stuff we thought was a good idea at the time, and just kind of see how it's evolved over the years is kind of kind of interesting. Excellent. Yeah, it's it and it definitely is interesting how uh, gear changes and whatnot, and what's relevant or uh, well. Yeah, no, no true true technique is really new though. Like you know how we say in the industry, what is old is new is what's new is old, and yep. But not not when it comes to innovation of uh, materials and firearm building techniques. That's for sure. Yep. And some of it stays the same. The first the first tube fed shotgun I bought is the one that I still use. So you know, I bought bought that M2, sent it to Accurate Iron all those years ago, and I haven't really changed it since. That's it. So, what do you? Sh- Shooting, what do you shoot a tube fed division? Are you still shooting tack ops with that tube fed or uh, or is limited tube in lim- fed? in limited I shoot tube fed or um this year I'm gonna shoot the new modified division tube fed also. So um but oh, yeah, okay. but, yeah. So when I was shooting tack ops tack ops and limited, uh I was shooting an M2, hung that up for a little while to shoot open uh last few years where I shoot a dissident. Um and then kind of kind of looking at doing a little bit of both here this season um waffling back and forth on exactly which events i'm going to shoot in which division um mm-hmm. entirely depends how these next few classifiers go because if, if i if i if i get my m card i'll probably hang it up and go back to a dot um mm-hmm. but um i'm so close that i'm gonna i'm gonna try and ride it 
until I get it done and not quit. So, well, speaking of that, you have Vortex Edge, the premier Wisconsin indoor range to shoot monthly indoor matches. And uh, I would say we're the premier done, so. premier range in the country. <laughs> I don't, I don't know that I've ever been to an indoor range that's that's been quite like that. Well, there there aren't very many facilities like that that exist. Um, just that size, right? Yeah, because you've got a couple twenty, what a couple twenty-five yard bays, a fifty-yard bay, and a hundred-yard indoor, right? Yes, there is a uh, um, kind of in a row uh, staggered. There is a shoot house. I forget the square footage of the shoot house, but a sim shoot house. Next to that, there's a fifteen-yard test fire bay for engineering, where they basically do mag dumps um, for recoil testing. Next to that, there's a 25 yard bay. Next to that, there's a 50 yard bay. And then next to that, there's a hundred yard bay, uh, all inside the, the two the, the 50 yard and the 25 yard, I forget the dimensions on them. They're at least, I'd say they're, they're at least 15 yards across. So they're fairly large indoor, indoor tactical bays. Um, Mm -hmm. and then what really makes it a feat is that they have the the ventilation system to support it, uh, the HVAC to make an indoor range work and get OSHA to sign off on it. It take they move a lot of air through there. Uh, that's mm-hmm. that's really the magic of it all. And then uh, somehow the they they move all that air through there and it's not howling, so you can actually like you can actually hear each other talk and stuff. It's it's kind of surreal. And the the temperature control is all there, but um, yeah, it's a fairly elaborate fairly elaborate facility um and uh we're we're very blessed to have access to it and we're blessed that the owners are willing to let the uh, the public use it for uspsa uh which was no small feat to uh, accomplish either yeah because now is that is vortex edge a separate building or is it attached to main uh hq uh it is a separate building on the uh on the campus so there was one, the building, the building that houses um, warehouse and manufacturing and offices. And then there was a separate building assembled that is the range. Currently, they're building a, th- well, and then there's, there's a, there was a third building they use. It's cold storage and uh, facilities maintenance type stuff. Uh, there's a fourth building being built, but it's the size of the original office building that will be just warehousing. So all the warehousing is going to move over into that building. And then the current warehouse is going to be absorbed in uh, more office space and manufacturing capacity. That's pretty cool. It's always growing. And you've got well, an outdoor facility there too, don't you? Uh, we do. We do. Uh, that facility, I believe, I believe it's 800 acres. Uh, most of that is a uh, buffer, um, but essentially they own a valley. Um, so we, the, the thousand yard range is basically in the bottom of a valley that, um, has, you know, backstops on both sides. Um, and yes, so yes, um, they don't, they don't, the, the situation with the outdoor range is kind of tricky right now. They don't actually use it for a lot of classes and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, yes, they do have a, a facility that, that we have access to for testing and stuff like that and, uh, limited use for other stuff. Vegas. that's pretty cool now you were talking about matches issue you know for you know all depending on whatever happens and whatnot uh what matches are you kind of looking forward to so far early on this year matches that i'm looking forward to um i'm really excited about uh the uh practical sh- uh practical competition shooting league the pcsl stuff that's going on out in uh, uh st george utah um, Max Legrandis, he's he started a two gun format. Normally, I'm not a two gun guy. People who it is my opinion that people typically who advocate for two gun are making an excuse not to shoot three gun. Because then, when you have a two gun match, they always have to like mow the lawn or file their taxes or something that day. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but uh, Max actually came up with a two gun format that's pretty cool. Uh, I like it. 
And he flushed that out into a, a carbine only match and a three gun match this year. So I'm going to try and get a couple of those in. So I'm excited about those. Um, I've always liked the United multi-gun league and they've um, branched out into a couple new venues this year. So I liked, I like the, uh, the, uh, the grands, the USSL grands championship. And this year they put that in Parma, Idaho, which is the home of the former home of the Ironman, the MGM Ironman, which is my all time favorite match that they don't do anymore. And I always take every opportunity to poke Travis Gibson. If perhaps he's listening to anything that he should do it again, but I know why. Um, but anyway, one of my favorite matches is moving to one of my favorite venues ever. So I'm really excited to go shoot the grands in Parma, Idaho. Uh, I was like, uh, surefire world multi-gun championship. I was like Memorial three gun, um, Bryce, uh, Bryce Lemlin from that organization actually works. Uh, he has the desk right next to me now. So very close to that organization. Uh, I always like to work the tri gun. Uh, I've tried to shoot the tri gun seriously a few times and I had way more fun working it. Um, and I also believe it's important that, um, anyone who's participating in the sport gives something back. So take you know take a take a match out of the schedule and go ahead and put your name on the list of work so that's one that i volunteer to work uh is the uh, the nordic vortex trigun i put on the uh, jeff kirkwell memorial three gun in august um so that one's near and dear i don't shoot that one well i shoot it but i don't um i don't shoot it as a competitor um Texas three gun Texas three gun championship is one of the premier matches for the year. Always like that one. Hopefully I'm going to get one of those damn belt buckles. One of these years. Um, I don't know. I'm going to shoot limited this year. Maybe that'll help. Um, and then, uh, there's a new match. There's a new match in Texas called big Tex. Um, that's being run by Jeremy Moore, formerly match director of the shooter source, um, championship. Uh, so a new, new venue, new name um but uh jeremy's a good match director um so um there's a new match starting up at the ranch tx uh, excited for that one as well um what else is there and then we're gonna try and pick up a couple of our our, our area championships and uh uh national oh, i'm gonna shoot the classic nationals so i'm i'm the only one left who likes single stack so i i, <laughs> I go i go to classic nationals um and then let all the other guys fight over the other ones. Right. Well, yeah. And you, uh, last year, well, 2021, you shot low cap nationals with Trevor chase, uh, Kenzie. Yes. Uh, and had a good time. Right. Yeah. And I missed, I missed being at the, the fike Moly incident oh, and by Bill, like Bill five minutes. <laughs> I missed, I missed the golf cart incident by like five minutes. <sighs> So close. I'm like well, for I'm like the Forrest that. Gump I mean, of I mean, shooting industry. Like for the lols. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah, no, that was a good match last year. <clears throat> I went minor by like two power factor. Uh so, <laughs> so shot the whole thing with a 45, uh, but went minor. So this year gonna gonna make sure my ammo makes major and maybe shoot limb 10. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, either way, it's it's either either or, right? I mean, yeah. nothing wrong with nothing wrong with either, especially if your gun can do it. So yeah, right. Well, you'd switch guns, but yeah, but yeah. So that was cool. Um, Vortex Tri Gun. I heard you were awesome RO on your stage from Kenzie. She always uh, she enjoyed your uh, state your safety brief on that uh, on your stage. Yeah, you got to read that thing twelve times. You might as well spice it up a little bit. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, I agree with you, though. If uh, it's, it's nice to give back to matches and, and work them. I've got a couple on the list this year that I'm uh, staffing. So I'm going to be yeah. smart, though. I'm going to record the written stage brief beforehand and then just play it for the play it for the uh, competitors because save that voice. Oh, that's well played, too. It's well played, too. And yeah, and you could just do the flight attendant hand gestures for all the. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But no, oh, I, yeah. I like, you know, I like working matches and shameless plug. Like, I mean, you don't have to be an RO to help, but mm -hmm. uh, it is a volunteer fueled sport. So if you are 
participating at a significant level, um, like once every other month, your club could probably use your help and it's the right thing to do to help. So jump in there, help with sign up, show up early to set up, stay late to tear down, do something because it, it takes a lot of work and it's all volunteers and ain't nobody making, making a living off of putting matches on. So, uh, if we all want matches to go to, um, pitch in and, and do your, do your part a little bit. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I can agree with that. I, uh, I, I told myself this year was going to be the year. I finally got a, a gun club membership and I, I've already emailed the USPSA staff. Well, the people who run the USPSA club, it's like, here's my number. You can just call me. I'll be at the, I'll be at all the matches. So yep. just, uh, I'll be there. Yep. Yeah, and um, David, oh, you you shot the Wisconsin sectional this year, didn't you? Yes. An open minor. Yep, on purpose. <laughs> on purpose. Yep. What do you think of the uh, Wisconsin sectional? Ah, uh, trying to remember shot with the staff who's at Holman. I always like Holman. Holman's one of the original clubs that I started shooting at. Um so it's always a little bit I don't know I guess I don't know if you live where you grew up or do you ever go back or um yeah I never left. I just stayed where I grew up so. Okay, so it's it's a little bit like I mean if for anyone who's ever moved away and then like come back to your hometown it's it's a little bit of that feeling every time I go to Holman. Because like I started shooting there in like oh seven and and uh it hasn't changed, it's kind of frozen in time. <laughs> We're still shooting the same targets. Um, so that's normally kind of what overpowers me when I go to Holman, but I, I liked it. Um and I started I started um um kind of picking up on like I want to shoot more bigger USPSA matches because um um kind of the inverse of three gun it's kind of nice to get your fill of one gun um on a little bit more intimate level and get to shoot some guns i didn't at that match but uh, i get to shoot some guns that don't necessarily fit into a three gun match so like again died in the wool single stack guy like left my own devices you know outside the industry it was working a, a regular dude job um, I'd shoot single stack and limited, uh, single stack and USPSA and limited and three gun and never, never seek to change. Um, but since life kind of led me this way, like I kind of, kind of like the opportunity, like, all right, here, here's a place where you can shoot single stack. Here's a place where, you, you know, you know, you can kind of focus on some of these other niche guns that I have. And I like to shoot them. I just don't get to shoot them very much, um, in, uh, in three gun, which is my primary sport. Or, um, in this case, um, again, kind of, kind of going to a little bit of my, my professional situation now, it just, it was never, my classification was never important to me in USPSA because it wasn't my primary sport. But now when I go to classes, um, or I take classes or, um, I'm getting pitched to by people, one of the things they say, you know, you get, you insert instructor yep uh so i was uh cag for 10 years blah 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 went to iraq afghanistan this that and the other thing came home i uh was at my local county swat team for blah 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 retired uh shot a little bit of competition made grandmaster grand you know master this master that blah 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 it's just part of their pedigree um and so since i i don't have um a pedigree of law enforcement or military in um, my circle, it became more important to me to have uh, that classification as kind of a uh, kind of a qualifier when when guys are sizing you up. Like, why should we why should we care what you say? Well, I mean, I've I've spent an unhealthy portion of my life shooting guns, you know. And, oh, okay. So, so getting the master or, or grandmaster title became more important to me. And so that's kind of where I started participating a little bit more in the sport and, and, you know, what, get, getting some classifiers on the books. Um, and so, um, I don't have an open major gun, but I shoot open in three guns. So, um, 
I shot that match in open minor because that's the gun that I have. But also I have this theory that um, if you're trying to shoot at the top 80, you know, if you're trying to shoot at the 85th percentile of the sport, you got to be getting alphas anyway. So, mm-hmm. so you could shoot a gun that's easier to get alphas with. And now the counter argument is, well, yeah, but if you throw a Charlie, I was like, yeah, but if you throw a Charlie, then anyway, I haven't really found anyone to agree with me yet, but <clears throat> an open minor gun is the gun that I had. And I kind of think that uh, you're not giving up too much and you might even be, be uh, saving yourself a little bit of recoil. If you're trying, you know, if I'm, if I'm not shooting master level score, I'm really not interested in the score. So, so they got to be alphas anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I bet you uh, made a couple people laugh like at chrono. It's like, well, I don't even think they had chrono that match, but if you go and like, take it, like they're like, what the fuck is this thing? <laughs> yeah. I should have just signed up for major and nobody would have known the thing's loud enough. Yeah, that's for sure. And that was the, oh, well, for the record, I've never my, done my, that. Right. <laughs> right. Now that's the Erebus, right? If I'm correct on uh, model names. Yep. Yep. The, uh, the Erebus. It's naked though. It doesn't have yep. a dot on it. Yep. I got to get another dot on this one. And then, uh, the, the OG Erebus, what the prototype gun, um, Ooh. not much change between these, but this was the concept. Um, I wanted a slide ride gun to shoot minor. And, uh, so Adam kind of came up with this thing, but, um, when the PT grips came out, they weren't doing aluminum at the time. So this is an old school PT aluminum grip. Um, one of the original four, four point six inch barrels. I don't know that this compensator is titanium, but they are now, um, a Schumann barrel that they probably don't make anymore. Um, but yeah, that's the OG one that, uh, that that became the model and Mm -hmm. then um i have two because sometimes sometimes one of them's wearing something that can't be seen so yeah that's got to be that's got to be a pain in the ass sometimes you're like oh wait i gotta go rip this one to ten off because no one can really see the one to ten yet (laughs) one to ten was really easy we shot that one in plain sight for a whole year nobody really caught on but it looked it looked so similar to the one to six that it was basically our brand ambassadors who were like ROs and they, they got a really close look at it and like, wait a minute, something that we're like, shut up. But, uh, um, yeah, for that year, like, you know, one of us would shoot and the other guy was right behind us at the dump barrel. Like, Oh, I'll take that quick throws a sock over it. And, and, uh, yeah, but I mean, we got, we got away with that one. I don't know if we'll ever get away with that again. Um, I've disguised, I've disguised a couple other optics. Um, you'd be surprised what you could accomplish with enough, uh, electrical tape. Um, but, uh, but yeah, sometimes, uh, mo- for the most part, uh, they products are very, 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 very close to being launched before they'll even let them, let them into the sales office, never mind out of the building. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, and they almost pretty much got to be uh, out the door, but you, like the day before they go out the door, right? To get to your influencers or your uh, your your testers, your outside yep. testing. And- yep. And even then, somebody somebody will leak it a couple days early, which I'm not quite sure if that's by design or by accident. But as long as, long as it's it not us, <laughs> right? As long as you don't don't mess with my NDAs. I always say that in Fisher's live streams. Don't mess with my uh, NDAs. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I'm assuming uh, I'm assuming Vortex went to Shot Show this year, though, correct? No, no, we didn't. Oh, no wonder. Well, you guys released the one, the what, the six to twenty-five or something. Uh, yeah. Yep. That new you released the new scope beforehand. Yep, we released uh, the Micro Six X magnifier, flip side magnifier, and then a six to thirty-six by fifty-six Gen three razor. That's pretty cool. Now, what's what was Vortex's uh, demographic for that new uh, LPVO well, magnified optic? I should say uh, that's tar- primarily targeted at the PRS crowd, the long range, the long range shooting crowd. Mm-hmm. I think 
I think they're specifically kind of targeting a, um, uh, a specific night force scope. That's really popular in that, in that, um, pond. I'm not really a long range shooter myself, so I don't, I'm no, just enough to be dangerous, mm-hmm. but, um, but yeah, they're kind of targeting that PRS crowd and the four and a half to 27 was starting to kind of be a dated product. So it was, it was due for a facelift, um, needed to lose some weight, needed, a a more, um, user-friendly turret system. And then, um, uh, the optics, the optic, the optical system has improved as well, uh, field of view and things like that. Um, so it was due for an upgrade. Um, and it was ready to go. Um, so it got launched Q1. I think there was some other stuff they wanted to launch Q1 um, that for whatever reason, a lot of it COVID related, just wasn't ready in time. And generally when products get to that stage of development, a lot of it has to do with manufacturing. So just the logistics of getting enough of them made to launch and then getting them across the pond and then getting them into distribution and then seeding them out to dealers. Um for most of the time that I've been at Vortex, so uh, we'll say five years, last five years or so, it's it's progressively become more important to them that when they launch a product that's ready to ship, than to launch all the cool stuff at Shot Show, um, which would kind of segue into what happened this year. But like um, coming out with a bunch of cool product at Shot Show and then it not shipping until the summer is kind of counterproductive because all the hype is gone and or people who were excited about it and ordered it are starting to get irritated that it hasn't shipped yet. So they kind of started working on the model of we will launch product when it's ready to ship, when we have it in our warehouse and we have it, you know, strategically staged at, you know, our 10 key, you know, big box stores. Um, when a product is ready to launch and we can get it to the customer, because that's really who we care about more so than than the, the you know the industry media or or um, or the fanfare of a show, uh, we really care more about how our customers. So when our customer hears about it, it's ready to go, um, and so they've moved more towards that model, and that's why you've seen less and less product coming out at Shot Show or at NRA Show, and it kind of trickles out throughout the year because it, it comes out when it's ready to go out um, as the trade shows themselves have become more archaic. So, um, you know, shot show itself is it's intended to be a distributor and a dealer show, like an industry show. So people can go there and place their orders for the year. It's not really for the media. It's not really, f- it's certainly not for social media, but those folks kind of got in. So there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that chaff floating around. And that's kind of like not the way that business is done anymore. Like we talk to all of our customers. You know, I talk to my key accounts all the time. I don't need to go to shot show to see them. So it kind of was get, It was already getting to the point where it's like, what, um, what's the value of a show? And then, um, with, with the additional restrictions this year, then the ROA got even thinner. Um, so ultimately our, our ownership decided that there's, there's other more productive ways that we could reach our customers than to attend shot show. So they decided, decided not to go. That's fair enough. Now, now that you mentioned shot show, cause I've talked to a couple of industry people about this. I kind of want to hear your take. So <clears throat> you're thinking that shot show is too much, taken over by the social media aspect of it and everybody and their brother seems to be able to get into shot show instead of the actual like dealers and people who actually need to be there making making sales or what it costs Mm -hmm. uh for what you pay i i think and i attend a lot of trade shows a lot of trade shows a lot of small trade shows um so I think for what you pay um, to get there, to for everyone to travel there, to set up the booth, to design the booth, to set up the booth, ship the booth, to man the booth, it's in Vegas. Um, mm-hmm. the, the sheer cost of a trade show, I think, not just SHOT Show in particular, but any trade show has to look at 
what are they charging and what are they actually getting? Because what they charge to get into some of those shows is uh, very, very, very expensive. And if really all we're doing is showing product um, to the public, then, you know, it's, it, it's on a v- different value scale. That's just my opinion. Mm-hmm. That's not, that's not the official vortex position. Um, that's just my opinion as an, as an industry observer, but um, uh, what you got to pay uh, Freeman and all the trade show people, uh, the trade shows have kind of become a bit of a racket if they're not targeted. Um, so the trade shows that I try to go to on the law enforcement side, they're very targeted in audience and they're very targeted in format. Um, so when I go to a SWAT conference, I'm not only looking at attendance numbers and who's going to be there, but what's the format? Because some of them have really good attendance decision makers, key departments, they're all there, but they're all there in breakout sessions and the breakout Mm -hmm. sessions are in building a, and then the vendor halls in building B. And so like, nobody's walking around. And so, you know, if, if you're not getting any foot traffic from those people, okay, well then it, it, it was the same, you know, non-value to be there. Um, uh, I went to one trade show. It was on a prominent military base. You know, all, all the key makers will be there. They put us, you know, and then we paid the, I forget what it was. It was thousands of dollars to be there. Um, and they put us on the end of a hall that nobody walked down for two days. And all we did was talk to the, the vendor across the hall from us, basically, or people who are sneaking out of meetings. And so it's like, okay, well, <clears throat> that's that's a show that we never went back to. And so that kind of thing, it's not just it's not just the show itself or a show, it's not just the venue, it's not just who's gonna be there, it's also the format. Um, the format has to be such for the whole trade show industry, I think the format has to be such that the vendors are getting exposure to the customers that they need to get exposure to um, for it to be a value. And I think some shows, um, this one being one of them, uh, have kind of lost sight in that. And they kind of were trading on that. Well, we're shot show. You have to be at shot show or you're not, you're not in the industry. Um, mm-hmm. I think 2020 kind of showed that that's not really the case. So I think, it's just kind of it's just kind of the capitalistic cycle of of trade shows themselves kind of have to redefine their value and what their purpose is. Um, that's just again, that's just my opinion as someone who goes to a lot of trade shows. Um, mm-hmm. Not uh, not specifically that of the company I work for. Right. No, it makes sense because if the ROI is not if the ROI isn't there, it's not worth it. And yeah, but there's a lot of stuff floating around about. Feasible. Um, you know, um, the politics of it or, um, this, that, and the other thing, um, that no, that wasn't, that wasn't the, that wasn't the decision from what I, from what I was told. Um, it wasn't, Mm -hmm. it wasn't COVID related. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, a a statement against whoever and this and that, and the other thing It's just, it's just, just, we, uh, we have other ways of communicating with our customers. Mm-hmm. And I, I kind of like the model of have it in the warehouse before you release it. So then you have all the hype and you can stir it up and mm-hmm. you can actually yep. sell it and make it You can make your money back. <laughs> yep. I mean, by contrast, we bring like our key accounts, we bring them here. So we bring them here to headquarters. We give them the tour. We spend two days at Vortex Edge and then we, you know, we, um, we do it that way. Um, so I, you know, all, all my, all my key law enforcement accounts, we bring them here to Vortex and give them the whole vortex experience instead of, you know, meeting them after we're tired of standing around on Wednesday, um, at, at the show. So, so it's not that, it's not that we're not engaging people. It's just that we're just doing it in a different way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which I, I think the people more enjoy, like at least your clients and your customers enjoy that better than your 30 seconds or an hour long meeting they get on some yep. random screaming, uh, trade hall. <laughs> yep. Yep. And they still go, they still are going to NRA show. NRA show is a consumer show. That's, Mm -hmm. 
And the people they send to NRA show are a completely different group of people than they send to SHOT Show. Because, and this goes for all industry people, you know, at, at SHOT Show, they send people who are there to take, you know, dealer and distributor orders and manufacturing type stuff. They don't necessarily send customer facing people. NRA is a customer show or is a consumer show. So the booths are full of consumer facing people. And our booth is that way also. And we are absolutely going to be at NRA show um, because Mm -hmm. that's, that's a show where we engage those types of customers. Um, So, so that, that distinction gets, gets missed sometimes too, I think just as a observation of someone in the industry. Gotcha. Now I want to change the subject just a little bit. Well, a lot of it. I want to kind of, we had a conversation a couple months back, I think about red dots in tech ops. There it is. (laughs) <laughs> and I wanted to make sure that we got far enough in where we we drug them through it. So I want to talk about it a if little bit. If you're still um, listening. <laughs> both sides of the coin a little bit. Yep. Mm-hmm. Exactly. If this is like the milk and cookies, like you, you gotta come find it. But um I all right, I'm gonna get I guess I'll give my opinion and then i'll let the actual three gunner talk because okay i'm not an actual three gunner and everybody knows it i'm a, I'm a uspsa guy but I, I i told i'll tell everybody this i told adam here that i would shoot in tac ops if red dots were allowed because one i don't own any pistols that don't have red dots on them so they all have red dots and it's a lot cheaper to set up a tac op shotgun than it is to go buy a dissident or a crappy uh, rock island that will not work reliably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and you're playing a different game. I mean, open uh, for as fun as open is, open is completely different. It's a completely different game. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. I mean, it's like the difference between tennis and badminton. Like, you know, I mean, similar, sure, but not same same um and so yeah i get um do you want me to pick up and run with it or did you have you know go right ahead i'll dabble so, in where i can but go ahead. so i mean it's been talked about it you know in in the circles where these kinds of things get decided it's been talked about for years years Okay, when I when I made that video a couple of months ago, and was like, I've never heard of such a thing. It's like, no, this has been talked about for a long time. The only caveat was that nobody wanted to be the first one to do it. Why? Because usually our sport slaughters whoever you know makes the first move. Um, so, um, it's been talked about for a while, and then I, um, uh, my friend Dave Hartman, uh, who also does a podcast, I don't. I don't know if you want to plug other shows on your show, but he, he approached me. Yeah. So the three gun show, he, he kind of, he kind of Martin Luthered his, uh, his proposals of, of modifications to make and just put it out there. And, you know, some people got excited some people didn't and whatnot. Um, but I kind of got a phone call, um, from, from Mark Stevens and he was kind of like, Hey, what do you think about this? And I was like, "Ah, I don't know. I mean, it sounds reasonable to me. He's like, well, would you do it for your match? And I thought about it for like 10 seconds. And I'm like, sure. Yeah. Okay. You know? And he's like, well, if you'll do it, I'll do it. And uh, I was like, yeah, okay. And then, um, so me representing, you know, JKM and um, I'm one of the, one of the key players in uh, the Wisconsin state three gun championship also. So it's like, we kind of had three entities that were willing to try it in the same year. And so we went public with that. Um, but uh, I listened to the show and one of the things Dave says in the show is uh, he's like, these are just my thoughts, my, you know, blah, 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 my proposal to the community. I'm not really in a position to implement any of this, um, but I think it'd be a good idea. And uh, I, I listened to that while I was driving, while I was driving to St. George, Utah. So like I listened to it at one 30 in the morning and then uh, um, the next day, like as the sun was coming up, I decided to, turn the selfie the selfie stick and make this video but i was like well dave's not in a position to implement this but i am and so be ye warned uh next year at the jkm 
match. This is what we're doing. You kind of have nine months to prepare. Um, and, uh, and then my DMS blew up. <laughs> and so, mm-hmm. and, and most of it, like your message, and this is, we were actually talking before the show. I actually have a screenshot of Alex's message because, um, Everyone who's like, oh, I've never heard of this. I, this is this is blasphemy. No one, no one actually wants this. I just like, I just like, uh, blizzard them with screenshots of all these people saying that this is a good idea. Um, and there's there's lots of people who don't really want to be very public about. Yeah, I think this is a good idea. Everyone who's really upset it, but doesn't actually want to confront anyone posts it on Instagram. Um, but almost all the feedback we got was resounding positive. So like mm-hmm. the, the vast majority of the community is on board. The industry is moving in this direction. Uh, new shooters to the community, you being an example, you know, this is, this is, you know, we, we kind of, we prided ourselves on, yeah, just, you know, the, the entry point for the action shooting sports is bring what you got and we'll shoot, you know, we'll find a place for you. Well, what the new shooter has nowadays is a carry optics type pistol. That's what they have. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of cadets are coming, you know, some police academies now they're coming out of the academy with red dot pistols. They don't, they don't really know iron sights. That's just kind of generationally where we're at. <clears throat> and then coupled with uh, I, the intention of TAC ops as a division was that it is a contemporary division. So it's, it's contemporarily what's being used in the field. Um, you know, open division was kind of a catch all for people who had, you know, open guns from USPSA. The other divisions are kind of frozen in time. Uh, you know, limiteds frozen at one power optics, heavy, heavy metals frozen at pump shotguns and 308. Um, the the contemporary division is tack optics but if tack optics is frozen in time then kind of what are we doing um mm-hmm. and that's where we kind of decided to move in this direction and now one of the things that came about from all that <clears throat> because you know some people really are just attached to tack optics and the sentiment sentimental you know value or the sentimental existence of it i guess mm-hmm. so when i got back from that trip one of the things that that my buddy Travis and Ruben are like, well, you're, why don't we, yes, we should do this, but let's not do it under the banner of TAC ops. Cause if you change TAC ops, well, then you're the one that slaughtered TAC ops. Right. Um, but they said, what you could do is, is introduce modified division, IPSC modified division, which mm-hmm. um, really is along the lines of kind of what we're already doing. Um, so they're like, what we need to do is introduce modified into the community. And then by default, TAC ops will survive or not survive. Um, and, and, you know, modified will kind of take its place. And then it's also on an event promoter, like, like me, an event promoter can decide which divisions they want to recognize. So at my match, we're just recognizing open and modified. So attack optics equipped shooter, attack ops shooter, their gear fits into modified division um, is kind of the route that we're going in a nutshell. But um, yeah, there's a lot of kind of, there's a lot of noise from a very vocal minority um, not to change tack optics. And a lot of times their, their argument doesn't go beyond, well, it's the most popular division. It's the biggest division. But it's also the only division that's hemorrhaging people. It's the only division that's getting smaller. Open mm-hmm. is getting bigger by leaps and bounds. Limited is growing. Heavy is growing where it's encouraged. And those people are all coming out of TAC Optics. So TAC Optics is the biggest now, but it's not going to be for very long. And when it's not the biggest division, then then what's the argument? Um, so I while everyone kind of points at, well, attack ops is the biggest division. So it's kind of above reproach, but yeah, but it's the only one getting smaller. And I think, um, people who are really interested in the progression of the sport need to take a critical look at this. And I think that's what we have done myself and, and other people in the sport at, at kind of a high administrative level. 
And this is kind of what everyone agrees need to, needs to happen. Just nobody wants to be the first one to do it. Um, but now we have several people doing it. So we're doing a JKM. We're doing a Wisconsin three gun championship. Trigun just announced that they're going to do it. Uh, Blue Ridge announced that they're going to do it. I call it new Ridge, but the new Blue Ridge is going to do it. The new, there you go. And then, um, <clears throat> Uh, Texas three gun was looking at it. They're already sold out for the year. So they're probably looking at it for like next year. Sorry, Aaron, if I'm speaking, I'm speaking for you. And I know that, I know that the United multi-gun league has been looking at it as well. And they, they kind of, um, they kind of spawn new rule books, you know, uh, like the week before the match. So who knows when they're going to come out with it, but they've, they've been, it's been on their radar too. So like several very prominent matches are moving in this direction so it's kind of it's kind of a future is now type thing really in Mm -hmm. in my opinion and it's not just dots on pistols i mean you know i mean the starting with shotguns loaded to eight rounds no matter how many it holds that was kind of stupid too um so now modified Mm -hmm. division 13 rounds you know full tube one in the chamber you know and then the gun has a maximum overall length um, you know, stuff like that is incorporated into the modified rules too, um, giving them some separation from limited and open to, to more of a middle ground where it was kind of biased towards a pretty limited esque division before. So, mm-hmm. well, and I, I can, I can see the point of, you know, people will say, well, the red dots easier to shoot the iron, divi- you know, the iron tri- pistol shooters, you know. They're like, it has a harder time at distance, but I mean, typically what paper is still what two hits on paper for scoring, if I'm correct. Yep. Yep. The targets get smaller, but, um, I mean, the bottom line is the people who are at the top of the sport are going to be at the top, no matter what top, you know, if whoever puts mm-hmm. the work in on irons, they're still going to be a top level competitive shooter. I mean, um, if you look at some of the, I mean, look at the times from, from USPSA matches, limited times are very competitive with carry optics times, you know? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Visually a, a red dot is it's easier for sure, but it's not, it's not the decisive advantage that an open pistol is an open pistol has a distinct undisputed advantage over a limited pistol because it has a dot and a compensator and a magazine that's 30 millimeters longer primarily that mm-hmm. last one <laughs> you know um so there's kind of there's several things that make an open pistol much different than a limited pistol where really all we're talking about is a slide ride dot being added to the rear of the slide no porting same magazine capacity so so yes, advantage if you want to be on the top of the equipment race, but um, not an unfair advantage, not any more so than a 2011 is over a CZ or a Glock. Mm-hmm. Realistically, I mean, 2011s have a significant advantage over more, more of those, um, what would we say? More attainable pistols. pistols. Yeah, service pistols. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they do have a distinct advantage, but they, they swim in the same pond. And I would argue that that dot versus iron is that is that similar gap in advantage um and it's Mm -hmm. and that's very different than open whereas you know the default before was just bump them to open but they don't want you know it's i think i think they're very comparable and uh and it's going to make the sport more approachable to more people um so i i mean and this year will be the year i mean it'll it'll tell you know, will the division be participated in? Will it not? Um, will more people come into the sport or will it not? You know, I mean, this is happening. So, you know, are you going to shoot three gun? You know, that's, you know, are, are we going to get people off the fence? Uh, and we won't really know until we do it a little bit. So. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that's a, that's a good point you made. And also getting that major unified body back that was so prominent when the back, what the three gun nation days where you had, that was the body. They had mm-hmm. the rules. They had mm-hmm. everything. And if we can, if multi gun then unifies, and everyone you can shoot multi gun and have the same rules, almost the same rules from mm-hmm. match to match to match, you're gonna get more people to participate. Yep. Well, and people forget too that at that time, if we go back to three gun nation days, 
Um, the reason tech ops got so big in that era was that uh, after a couple seasons, uh, Three Gun Nation launched the Pro Series, Three Gun Nation Pro Series. The Pro Series only recognized TAC Optics because at that time it was the most prominent division. It also fit more sponsors for the show because uh, Three Gun Nation was par particularly interested in uh, fielding a TV show. And so if you wanted to be on the pro series and you wanted to chase the $50,000 prize, you had to be in TAC Optics. Uh, whereas before they were pulling top talent kind of by, by representation out of all the divisions or people were, were kind of, kind of, uh, I don't know if sandbagging is the right word, but Trophy hunting, maybe people were he we were leaving talk topics to go into divisions that they thought they could point well in to get into the series. So that the the influx of that TV show and the cash prize disproportionately skewed participation in tack optics, um, specifically for that reason. And then when the show left, well, we had people kind of you know they had gear and tack you know that was the gear that they had so they stayed in the division but as time has gone on um people in the some people in the sport have ventured into other equipment divisions and so the competition vigor in tack optics has started to dilute down and so some people who only shoot tack optics because they want the they shot tack optics because that was the most competitive division they started to realize that it wasn't the most competitive division anymore. Um, and so they're kind of left at this crossroads too. And that's where everyone kind of comes to me now. And oh, Adam, I think, I think the time has come. I think, I think I have to go to open. Why'd you have to go to open? Well, I mean, there's, there's nobody in tech ops anymore. Like, Oh, okay. You know? So, so that's going on too. Um, and the part of the reason that TAC Ops is and was so big was because of that one era in time where there was a TV show and a significant cash prize. Shoot that division, and you had to shoot that division to uh, to even have have a dog in that fight. Mm -hmm. Well, and even like everyone's leaving production in uh, USPSA, going to carry optics because there's no heat in production anymore. Everyone's like, yeah. "This is I want yeah. nine millimeter high cap." Yeah, I never thought I'd see the day that production would be like this non-factor of a division <laughs> i think more people should single stack in production now <laughs> like I, I don't have any numbers to back that up but i was like yeah i mean i mean when i was when i was um coming up in the sport and shooting more uspsa before i focused on three gun exclu yeah, not exclusively but more kind of lost touch with uspsa for a while i came back and like nobody's shooting production anymore like everybody was shooting production when i left like, I mean, mm -hmm. a couple old guys had limited guns and open guns, but everybody, all the millennials were shooting production, you know, and now not only are, are the newer people to the sport shooting production, but the older folks in the sport are shooting, or excuse me, the newer folks are shooting carry optics and the older participants are finding their way too, because as their eyes age, that's kind of the direction they have to go unless they want to shoot an open gun and not everybody wants to shoot an open gun. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of that, that wave is kind of hard to deny. And until, you know, this, this round of introducing a modified division, three gun hasn't really had an answer for that other than go shoot open. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, that is, that is true for sure. Now, Adam, I want to kind of get near the end of the show, but, um, where can uh, more people get information about your match um, and matches uh, like in the multi-gun side? Because most, most of the listeners are probably USPSAers. So yep. where can they, where can they go for like some multi-gun information? Uh, the best multi-gun, I mean, to find the matches, same place you find USPSA matches, practice score.com um, has all their, all of them on there. Um, my match, the, the JKM or Jeff Kirkwell Memorial, that will be actually, that will actually be going live here in a couple days. Um, that's a, um, a one day or it's, it's a two day match. One day we shoot stages in traditional sense. We use those scores to see the bracket. And then the second day is, uh, is head to head shoot offs, uh, in double elimination and a bunch of side stages and stuff like that. But, uh, the, the Jeff Kirkwald, uh, will be on there. 
Uh, I'm also the range master for the Wisconsin state three gun championship. Uh, that's on practice score. Um, registration for the tri guns going live. That one usually sells out in minutes. Um, but, um, otherwise, um, the United shooting sports league, USSL, they have several major events throughout the country. Uh, the practical competition shooting league is Max Lee league in, um, St. George. Mm -hmm. I recommend you look into that one. Um, Memorial three gun foundation puts on a good one on the East side of the country, uh, near Fort Bragg. Um, lots of good stuff going on in Texas. Really, really just kind of get on, get on the Facebook, get on the practice score, get on the Instagram, start asking around. Um, you'll find the information or, um, uh, my buddy Dave does, uh, the three gun show, lots of good information on there as to where to find that. Um, and you'll kind of get an idea of some of the names to look for and, and where to find all that stuff. But, uh, if you look around on practice score, you'll definitely find the matches and there's almost certainly, uh, club club events going on in your area. Uh, but it's just kind of a matter of, of, uh, it's, it's, a, if you know where to look, you'll find it. So it's the same place you look for USPSA stuff. Gotcha. So there you go, guys. Look for some good information. Go find out more about multi-gun um, and three-gun and whatever you want to call it. I call it multi-gun, but that's because I'm special. But Adam, we got to pay the sponsors' bills, too, so we got to plug them. So go ahead and uh, share the world with your... Uh, who are your sponsors? Uh, primarily, Vortex Optics. They, uh, they're the big driving force behind what I do. Um, I also uh, am affiliated with uh, Atlas Gunworks. So, um, I'm on, I'm an ambassador for the Atlas Gunworks shooting team and then, uh, primary weapon systems on the rifle side. Um, so PWS piston driven rifles, primarily what I use. Um, and then on the shotgun side, uh, been, I've been, uh, friends with the dissident arms guys since they were in their first garage. Um, so if you're, if you're looking for box fed, uh, box fed shotguns or AK type stuff, um, dissident arms is another one to look up. Um, but, uh, it's a small industry. We know everybody, we're all friends, but, uh, those are, those are primarily the people that are behind my program. Well, that's pretty cool. And where can they, uh, find you on the internet, Adam? Uh, let's see. I'm, I kind of went dark on a lot of it, but I'm still on Instagram, uh, three gun underscore a max on Instagram. Uh, feel free to slide into my DMS. You're not bothering me. Ask me whatever you want. Um, Otherwise, uh, Monday to Friday, you can call into Vortex Optics at uh, 800-426, whatever the other numbers are. It's uh, 1-800-4-4-Vortex, I think is what it is. But if you call in, hit nine, you'll get to me if I'm in the office. Um, but uh, their Instagram, I'm on Facebook too. Honestly, not paying attention to Facebook very much anymore. So Instagram is probably the best place to get a hold of me. Uh, if you're listening, listening on this, this medium. Mm -hmm. Well, there you have it guys. Um, Adam, like I said, thank you again for coming on. It's been a blast, even though we had technical difficulties for a while, but Hey, we got through it and, uh, <laughs> it was a blast. Oh, we'll definitely have to have you back on, um, and see how this modified work has gone for you guys. So, uh, that'll always be a fun one. And, uh, yeah, but listeners, uh, thank you for checking us out, checking out Manny talk shooting. Um, until next time guys, get out and do the things. We'll see you on the next one.